can take you straight to Downing Street now as the press briefing is just about to start. Good afternoon. I'd like to update you on our response to COVID-19. I'm joined today by Dr. Jenny Harris, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer. As of 9 a.m. today, 127,737 people have now been tested for the virus. 108,215 have tested negative. 19,522 have tested positive. Of those who have contracted the virus, 1,228 have sadly died. The virus is indiscriminate. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, or how old you are. We each have a part to play by staying at home, protecting the NHS, and helping to save lives. We all have a duty to one another to keep everyone safe. So today, I'd like to give you two updates before answering questions. The first is on the plans that I have put in place to ensure that every corner of the country can confront the coronavirus epidemic. The second on what the government is doing to shield the most vulnerable people in society. Now, on the first question, I've put in place in all parts of the country, procedures to ensure that everywhere can be ready to move forward together. All parts of the country are now on an emergency footing. This is an unprecedented step in peacetime. We haven't done anything like this since the Second World War. This means that we're establishing strategic coordination centers across the whole country. Each centre is led by gold commanders. We're bringing together senior members of the emergency services, the police, the fire service, the ambulance service, with local authorities and the NHS to lead communities through this challenging period, from Cornwall to Cumbria. We've embedded within each of these groups members of the armed forces, including some of the finest military planners in the world. These groups are planning the local response to the virus, using their expertise, their judgment, and their leadership to ensure a comprehensive, a coordinated, and a consistent response across the country. Now, one issue that they have been helping us to coordinate and about which I know there is a lot of concern, is the provision of personal protection equipment. We simply cannot and should not ask people to be on the front line without the right protective equipment. We have a clear plan to ensure that those serving this country at this time have the right equipment. We've established the National Supply Distribution Response Team, and they're supported now by members of the armed forces and other emergency services who are working around the clock to deliver the equipment to the people who need it most. 170 million masks, 42.8 million gloves, 13.7 million aprons, 182,000 gowns, almost 10 million items of cleaning equipment, and 2.3 million pairs of eye protectors, all delivered to 58,000 NHS trusts and healthcare settings, including GP surgeries, pharmacies, and community providers. Every single GP practice, dental practice, and community pharmacy has had a PPE delivery. All care homes, hospices, and home care providers have, or will shortly, receive a delivery. To NHS and social care workers, all those 
who rely on this equipment and to their families and loved ones watching this afternoon. We understand and we will not stop until we have got you the equipment that you need. Now, last weekend at this press conference, the Prime Minister and I explained why 1.5 million people who are extremely vulnerable, vulnerable to the virus due to their underlying health conditions needed to stay at home for a period of 12 weeks and avoid face-to-face -face contact. Since then, the NHS have written to almost a million of these people and outlined the steps that they need to take to protect themselves. We've also established a dedicated web page on gov.uk, which those in receipt of the letter should go to, to let us know whether or not they need further assistance over the course of the next 12 weeks. There's also a new phone number, which is on the letter they have or will receive shortly. Now, if this applies to you, I know that you will find this a very worrying time. You'll be thinking about how you can continue to access the medicine that you need, how you can get the food and other essential supplies that you rely on. If you don't have family or friends or neighbours nearby who you can rely on, then the NHS will deliver your medicines through the Community Pharmacy Network. And if you register online or using the phone service that we've set up, letting us know that you need support, then we will deliver food and supplies to your doorstep. And this weekend, I saw for myself firsthand the first deliveries being made. The packages included cereal, fruit, tinned goods, tea bags, biscuits, toiletries, and other essentials. The first 50,000 will have been sent out by the end of this week. And we're ramping up production to send out as many as are required for as long as it takes. If this applies to you, while you will now have to be at home for a prolonged period of time, and that will be difficult, I want you to know that you are not alone. We're here to support you for as long as you need us. We've all been hugely impressed by the commitment and the dedication of those working in social care, in local councils, delivering essential public services, like ensuring that the bins continue to get collected, none more so than me as the Secretary of State for Local Government. We all respect the 12,000 heroic former doctors and nurses and paramedics who have come back to work and been deployed this weekend. And I think we've all been moved by the number of people who've signed up to be one of the NHS voluntary responders. Today, we can announce an extraordinary three quarters of a million people have signed up to do that. In every city, in every town, in every village, there's going to be work to be done. And in each of us, there is the power to do it. And so please take part, please play your part. Please consider your friends, your family, your neighbors when you're shopping, please call the elderly and support them. When this is done, and it will be done, we all want to be proud of the part that we've played together. Thank you very much. And now I will answer some questions from the media. And I think uh, our first afternoon. question today is from Simon Israel from Channel 4 News. Good afternoon, Simon. Good afternoon, Minister. I have two questions, one for you and one for Dr Paris. My question to you is, 10 days ago, my minister predicted the tide would be turned in 12 weeks. What's the current forecast? And to Dr Paris, I want to ask, a message sent to staff today at King's Hospital Trust said, and I quote, the number of deaths being reported at King's in national figures is below what they are experiencing. This is not just King's, there are a number of other trusts 
and the center has been made aware. Are, at what point are we being given accurate, up-to-date figures on the numbers who have died? Well, thank you, Simon. If I can begin before handing over to Jenny, nobody's pretending that this will be over in a few weeks. But what the Prime Minister said in the past, and I will reiterate today, is that if we all play our part, if we all follow the very clear medical advice, then we can turn the tide of this virus. And at the heart of that is a very simple message, which is to stay at home, by doing so, protect the NHS, and then save lives. If we follow that advice, then we can turn the tide. And the more we adhere to that advice, the more lives will be saved and the faster we'll begin to do that. Jenny. Thank you. Um, so just picking up the point about the tide and the turning, I think this is an important message to get across to the public. Uh, as I said previously on a number of these uh, interviews, this is a bit of a moving feast which is dependent on the actions that we take as individuals and uh, collectively as a population. If we practice social distancing effectively, we will move the peak across and that is a good thing because as we move it, it will drop. So we need to keep practicing. Uh, the data that we have, the modelling going forward, uh, will uh, suggest that in uh, in the time period which the uh, mi uh, sorry the prime minister noted, which was 12 weeks, we would get on top of the virus, and that is exactly what I hope we will do. The proof of that will come in around two to three weeks, and that is because our most constant figures, and we'll come back to this in a moment, are the deaths and the deaths follow the numbers of infections. And there's usually a two or three week time lag, and we also need a, a lag for the effectiveness of the intervention measures to come through. So uh, what I keep saying frequently, and I'm sorry if I'm repetitive, is that we need to wait for two to three weeks to see what we uh, have achieved collectively, and then the slope of that curve will start to indicate where a new peak will be, but we're optimistic that that peak will be lower. So we need to keep looking at this, but it will be two to three weeks before we are clear whether the peak has shifted across or not. So I think that was the, the first question. The second one that you raised was around deaths. Um, clearly, every death that we have is a really sad event. It involves a family uh, and uh, l uh, a lot of sadness. We have to make sure that when we're reporting, uh, the family is content and knows and that all our data is absolutely accurate. For any event like this, whether it be COVID, whether it was Ebola, whatever it is, there is always a time lag for us to check and evaluate that the data across the system is linked. We do not want to be misreporting data and then having to correct it. Uh, the public would not have confidence if we were doing that. And as we have had, sadly, to register more deaths, that time period takes longer. So um, I'm not aware of the communication from, uh, from King's. It may be that that's gone back into the, the NHS. Uh, but what I can say is all of our data links up and there is a time lag. And for the reporting yesterday, it will have been the deaths reported the previous day. So it is inevitable that there will be a time lag. This is not an issue of transparency. It's an issue of ensuring that all those families that need to know uh, and all the parts of the system can consolidate the information and ensure it's accurate for the public. Thank you, Jenny. I think that's, that's very clear. I'll take the next question from Paul Brand from ITV. Paul. Yeah, thank you. Firstly, to the Deputy Chief Medical Officer. Originally, we were told that the lockdown measures would be for three weeks. Is it safe to now assume that they will go on for much longer than that? And to the Secretary of State, when will the government be making that reassessment so that people can plan their lives? Thank you. Shall I start with that one? So I think uh, if you look back, what the Prime Minister said was he would review in three weeks, and that actually links back to the point that I've just made. Uh, it would be foolish of us to start something one day and assume uh, that it was going to have an impact the next. Uh, for all of us, it's taken quite some time to get used to this new way of living, uh, to ensure that we practice social distancing uh, and we stick to that. And as a population, we have evidence that we're getting better at that as we go through. People are staying at home more as they should. 
uh, they're using transport less, they're only going to work when it's essential. So those measures have now been in place solidly for a, a week or two. Uh, we need another couple of weeks to see that through. And as I've just mentioned earlier, the, uh, the issue of the three weeks is for us to review where we are and see if we've had an impact jointly on the slope of that curve. But I think to make it clear to the public, if we are successful, we will have squashed the top of that curve, which is brilliant, but we must not then suddenly revert to our normal way of living. That would be quite dangerous. If we stop then, all of our efforts will be wasted and we could potentially see a second peak. So over time, probably over the next six months, we will have a three-week review. We will see where we're going. We need to keep that lid on, and then gradually we will be able to hopefully adjust some of the social distancing measures and gradually get us all back to normal. So I think three weeks for review, uh, two or three months to see whether we've really squashed it, um, but about three to six months, uh, ideally, and lots of uncertainty in that, but then to see uh, at which point we can actually get back to normal. And it is plausible that it could go further than that. We just need to wait to see how successful we've been. And, and of course, the bottom line is, as we always say, keep practising good social distancing because we will manage it quicker and better between us. Well, absolutely. From the outset of this crisis, we drew up the measures that could be implemented and then on expert medical advice, we have chosen the right time for this country to implement them. And we've taken a number of very significant steps on social distancing over the course of the last 10 days, as Jenny has just said. And it is the nature of this virus that it takes a couple of weeks to see how effective each one of those in turn has been. When we've implemented them, we've said that we will review these in three weeks or so. And when the Prime Minister uh, made his announcement on Monday, uh, bringing to a close non-essential shops and encouraging us all to uh, stay at home, to restrict what we do in our leisure time, he made clear that we would review these steps at Easter on the basis of the expert medical opinion, and that's exactly what we intend to do. But the evidence that I have seen suggests, as Jenny has said, that the public are generally complying. Uh, I've spoken to a number of chief constables from across the country over the course of the last few days, and uh, business owners are behaving very responsibly. Of course, there are always small numbers of people who aren't. But in general, the public is doing the right thing. The more we comply, the more we will be able to protect the NHS, to save people's lives, and the faster we'll turn the tide on the virus. If I can take the next question from uh, David Shookman, who's from the BBC. David, good afternoon. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, two questions, if I may. First, uh, Mr Jenrick, to you. The Prime Minister, in his letter, talks about levelling with the public, about things getting worse before they get better. What do you think the coming week is going to look like? And then a question for Dr. Harris. We've had confirmation of the very sad death of an ENT surgeon, Amged al-Harani. What do you think that says? What message does that send to NHS staff on the front line? Well, thank you very much, David. And can I also give my uh, deepest sympathies to the family of uh, Dr. al-Harani? We heard the news just a few moments ago that he'd very sadly passed away. With respect to your question, um, the Prime Minister has now written, uh, or will be over the course of this week, to all the households in this country, setting out very clearly the task that is before all of us. We see on the news the difficult scenes in other European countries, like Italy, for example, and the deaths that we are reporting daily in these press, press conferences are very sobering. Every death is a tragedy. We don't want to see any unnecessary death. And so what the Prime Minister has said to all of us in that letter is that we all have the power to influence the course of events with respect to this virus. If we want to protect people's lives, if we want to help the NHS to be able to have the capacity to continue to perform the good quality public service that we all want it to do throughout the course of the virus, then we need to take heed of the medical advice. We do need to stay at home. We'll, by doing that, we'll protect the NHS and we'll help to save people's lives. So this is on all of us. 
We all have a responsibility to protect each other. We just need to follow the advice in the days and weeks ahead. Jenny. Thank you. Um, well, clearly, you will not expect me as a medical professional to, to comment on an individual case. That would be normal practice. Uh, but equally, as a medical professional, of course, I'm very saddened by the fact that one of our uh, professional colleagues has passed away. Um, it clearly is uh, a worrying event. Uh, it's worrying for the nation because it's another death in our statistics. It's, a, it's another loss to a family. Uh, and it will be a loss to an NHS family as well. Um, I think for NHS staff on the front line uh, and, and our caring staff, it's not just in our health services. Uh, it's all people who are battling against this virus. They will inevitably be concerned. Um, and uh, some of the work that we're doing around communications uh, and around uh, personal protective equipment is to just try and ensure there is a common understanding between us uh, of uh, the support that is there for them. Uh, it is in no one's interest uh, that we lose our colleagues on the front line, and we really, really want to support them. So um, the only thing I would say is, though, uh, clearly, in a, in a disease like this, uh, which is affecting everybody, uh, we just need to remember that it's not uh, just the NHS or just uh, a family. Uh, we, we're finding this right across the population. It will affect all of us. It may, will upset, undoubtedly, our colleagues in the NHS. <coughs> Excuse me. But we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't take that as any signal specific to the NHS. We do have some new guidance coming out for colleagues uh, in the NHS shortly, um, and I'm hoping that will help to support them in their work on the front line. Thank you, Jenny. And the guidance that's going to be published shortly will also apply to those working in other Absolutely. essential public services, for example, <laughs> in social care, um, in local government and other settings, so that they can have the best possible advice as to the type of PPE that they need Absolutely. to continue to do their role uh, safely in the days ahead. The, the next question, I think, is from Sam Lister from The Express. Sam. Hello, thank you. Um, if I could ask Dr. Harries first, um, I just want to be really clear about what you've said. Are you saying that come judgment day in two or three weeks' time, if you've not seen the necessary changes that you require, the country realistically is facing lockdown for six months? And if I could ask the Secretary of State, um, we've seen a number of police forces over the weekend set up hotlines um, where people can report concerns about uh, their neighbours or other people they believe have flouted the rules. Um, would you encourage people to raise their concerns with these hotlines? So I'll, I'll start with that one. So I think just to be clear on what I have actually said, I don't think I have said we will be in lockdown for six months, just to be clear. Uh, I also haven't said we'll definitely be uh, in the best place possible in two or three weeks. The important thing is this is a moving target. If we do well, it moves forward um, and comes down and we manage all our care through our care, health and care systems sensibly uh, in a controlled way. And that's what we're aiming for. Um, the the issue about the two to three weeks is uh, there is a time lag between somebody, when somebody gets the disease uh, and becomes symptomatic and potentially transmits it. And then very sadly, for those people who become ill, uh, they will be usually are ill for a, for a period of time uh, and then deteriorate in their health status. Um, and sadly, some of them will end up dying. And there are time periods for that. So one, for how well we do our intervention. If we all stop shopping on Monday, we would not expect any any of this data to change on Tuesday, we would expect to start seeing a footfall dropping over the first week. We would start to see uh, new infections dropping over the next week, and we would start to see deaths dropping over the following week. So the implication there is, and the Prime Minister's letter is, we actually anticipate that our numbers will get worse over the next week, possibly two, and then we are looking to see whether we have managed to push that curve down and we start to see a decline. The issue about the time frame is really important. So this is not to say we would be in complete lockdown for six months, but it means that as a nation, we have to be really, really responsible and keep doing what we're all doing until we're sure that we can gradually start lifting various interventions, which are likely to be spaced based on the science and our data, 
um, until we gradually come back to a normal, uh, normal way of living. And that may mean that we have a few bumps on the way rather than the nice curves that you've seen in graphs in the, in the media or on our charts. It's really important that we all do that together. We will not have succeeded until we get right to the end of, of this outbreak um, and we understand uh, how the disease transmits. As we get more information in due course about the pattern of transmission, then we will have more insight into how to manage that tail end of it and we can provide more information then. Thanks, Jenny. Um, <clears throat> well, as I said earlier, the measures that we've taken, uh, which are very restrictive and uh, not things that we've taken lightly, the evidence that we've seen so far suggests a high degree of compliance from members of the public. The scenes that we saw last weekend have, by and large, not been replicated this weekend. Uh, police forces have reported uh, very few instances of non-essential retailers remaining open uh, against the rules. And so, you know, I think it's very encouraging that people are increasingly taking this seriously and playing their part in helping us to protect the NHS and save uh, lives as a result. Police forces have powers. They are able to enforce these measures. They can fine individuals, and those fines can ratchet up for the very small number of people in society who repeatedly refuse to follow the measures and take uh, the advice of the police. And that's absolutely right. But we want to do this by consent. We want to do this with us all coming together in a national effort. And there's a moral obligation on all of us to play our part, protect ourselves, but also protect others. And that's regardless of your age. And there are many young people who feel that they are invincible. That isn't correct. The virus affects all of us. But each of us has the ability to protect others. And so I really urge once again everybody to pay heed, to adhere to the strong medical advice that we've all received to stay at home. And where you do go out, do it in the manner that we've advised, respecting social distancing uh, advice. And when you can't work from home, try to work from home, but when you can't do so, then go to work and at work follow Public Health England's guidance whilst you're there as well, so that together we can protect the country and begin to turn the tide. Now, I'll come now to the last question, which is from Jack Blanchard from Politico. Jack, good afternoon. Uh, thanks very much. Um, a question for each of you, uh, please. Uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, uh, we've seen very alarmingly large increases in the number of deaths over the last, well, each of the last two or three days. Um, is that as you had expected, or are the number of deaths increasing more quickly than you had hoped? Uh, and Secretary of State, have you modelled more extreme social distancing measures should they be necessary? And can you, can you give us an indication of where things might go if what we're doing so far doesn't prove to be enough? Um, so thank you for that, Jack. Um, Sadly, the answer is yes. It is as expected in many ways. It's, it's not a, an easy position to stand on a platform and say we expect a large number of people to die, but we have a pandemic on our hands and it is an, uh, an unprecedented event for this generation in this country. Um, I think uh, it is because of where we are on the curve, all, all the above, as I've said previously, applies. We are expecting that that number will increase for the next week or two, uh, but then we anticipate that if we keep doing what we're doing, and I can't emphasise that we have to keep doing it, it's no good just doing it for a few days and stopping, uh, that we do anticipate that those numbers will start to drop. Uh, the important thing about the number of deaths, uh, and uh, it is a very, um, sadly, an easy to count uh, statistic in, if you like, and uh, it's quite difficult to uh, translate what it means often to the public in terms of death rates, and there has been a huge uh, amount of media uh, written and reported on that, but it is a sort of stable statistic, but it lags behind our impressions on uh, the rate of increase of uh, infections. So we just need to watch it carefully, hold tight for a week or two, keep doing what we're doing, and then come back and ask me the question again, uh, and I think hopefully we'll be on the way down a little bit. 
That's right. Well, I think, as Jenny said, the task for us all now as a country is to adhere to the social distancing measures that we've already announced. These are very significant moves, you know, unprecedented in our peacetime history. If we all follow those measures, then there's every reason to believe that we can turn the tide on the virus and we'll be able to protect the NHS and to save people's lives. Of course, if those measures prove insufficient or if uh, members of the public are not complying with them, then we will have to consider what further options are available to us. But that is not our intention. We hope and believe that these measures can be sufficient, but it will take, because of the nature of the virus, a couple of weeks, as Jenny's articulated, before we can see whether that's truly happening. And, and if I could just add to that, just for reassurance, because obviously we've talked a lot about the uh, capacity of the NHS to manage uh, the number of people flowing through. We have plenty of capacity in the NHS right now to manage people coming through the system. So those deaths represent very sadly individuals who have not been able to respond to the high quality care that the NHS has provided. Very good. Well, I think there's, sorry, I think there's uh, one further question. Um, from uh, Channel 5. I, I think the further question is from um, Kate Proctor from The Guardian. Oh, sorry, I do apologise, Kate. Go ahead. It's okay. Hi, good evening. Afternoon. Um, you'll have seen the reports of Brits stranded abroad who really, really want to get back to the UK. Um, what can you tell us about the size and the scale of the repatriation package that you're going to put together? Germany has put aside 50 million euros. Will Britain be putting together something on, on a similar scale? And will you be using the RAF to bring people home? And if I may, um, Michael Gove this morning said that the UK hadn't got all the information that it needed from China to make some decisions earlier on in the coronavirus outbreak. Do you know what information was missing from decision making? Well, thank you, Kate. Well, firstly, with respect to British citizens overseas, we have and take seriously our responsibility to protect our nationals wherever they are in the world. That's a top priority for the government and the Foreign Secretary has been working extremely hard with British missions all over the world to try to bring those citizens back to the UK and he spent this weekend speaking with his counterparts in a range of countries where there are citizens who we want to get back safely to the UK as soon as possible. We've advised British citizens abroad to come back to the UK whilst there are still commercial flights available. That isn't the case in all countries but it is in many. We haven't ruled out repatriation flights, and we are doing those uh, in some cases. There is a flight ongoing at the moment, for example, to Peru to bring back a group of British citizens who've been in a difficult situation there. If we need to do more steps of that kind in the days ahead, then we will, of course, do so. We want to get those British citizens back safely uh, to the UK. With respect to the international picture more generally, well, the UK is leading the international efforts. This is a global pandemic, and we want to play our part to the full. The Prime Minister has been speaking to his counterparts from the G7 and the G20. We are now the world's leading country in offering funding to support vaccine research. Almost £500 million uh, we've offered, and we will put more at the disposal of that very important mission if that's required. Um, and there may be more steps that we can do as an international community in the future. And we want to be absolutely at the heart of that. Of course, there will be lessons to be learned in the future about how we and other countries have responded to this virus. But the UK, our government at the moment, is focused 100% on trying to save lives here. And that means putting in place the measures that we've discussed today. It means supporting the NHS and social care, shielding those vulnerable individuals for whom we've been uh, providing food parcels beginning this weekend. And above all, for people listening this evening to this broadcast, it means each and every one of us in our own lives, following the advice from Jenny and her colleagues, stay at home, protect the NHS, and that is the way that we can all save lives and begin to turn the tide on the virus. So thank you, Jenny, for joining us this evening. And thank you very much indeed, everybody, for watching at home.